Michelle. Uh, good good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for to, to this afternoon's webinar, Defending the Right to Defend Palestinian Rights. Uh, I'm Dr. Michelle Staggs Kelsall, and I'm a co-director of the Centre for Human Rights Law at SOAS University of London. And together with my colleague, uh, Professor Dina Mata from the Centre for Palest Palestine Studies here at SOAS, we wanted to host this webinar and lead a discussion amongst uh, some of the uh, Palestinian NGOs who've been the recent target of um, an Israeli determination as to determine them as terrorist organizations. In addition to Professor Michael Link, who is of course the special rapporteur on the occupied Palestinian territory to get his opinion with respect to the situation in Palestine vis-a-vis -vis this most recent um, and a counter-terrorism counter or alleged counter-terrorism uh, effort by the Israeli government. Uh, just to frame our discussion today, I wanted to mention um, a few things that we here at SOAS University of London are currently undertaking in support of efforts of Palestinian NGOs in this regard. Dina, perhaps you would like to begin by speaking to the statement made by 75 academics here at SOAS with respect to what the situation is at the moment. Uh, thanks, Michelle. So I'm, I'm joining here as the chair of the Center for Palestine Studies, and obviously the name uh, speaks uh, for itself. Uh, but the statement in support of Palestinian human rights and human rights organizations was a statement that we initiated and was signed by uh, about 77 academics uh, from SOAS in support of uh, Palestinian NGOs and uh, human rights organizations working for uh, to protect uh, Palestinian rights, and also in uh, you know in opposition to the Israeli action, which is um, actually a, a criminalization of human rights advocacy and other lawful forms of oppositional civil activity in the occupied territories. So we, you know, issued the statement, and uh, we were very pleased with with the um, with the response to it. Uh, but uh, I, in the interest of time, I guess we will be. I, I'll hand back to Michelle because you want to talk about the other uh, very quickly. The other action that uh, colleagues at the law department and other departments are taking to uh, continue with the action. Thank you, Dina. Yes, with respect to the Center for Human Rights Law uh, and uh, other members of the SOAS community, we are bringing an urgent appeal uh, in support of the Palestinian organizations who've been designated as terrorist organizations under Israel's counterterrorism law by Israel's Minister of Defense on the 19th of October of this year and the military ordered issues by the West Bank commander of the Israeli ministry, a military on the 3rd of November, 2021. This appeal urges the special rapporteurs uh, to request Israel to withdraw, withdraw the des designation of the organizations as terrorist organizations and the corresponding military orders in the West Bank to affirm the commitment to uphold rights guaranteed in the UN Declaration on right, Human Rights Defenders and finally, to refrain from any measures that con constitute unjustified interference with the legitimate work of the organizations. For us, of course, um, the factual background to this memo probably does not need much inter introduction. I'm, I'm certain that many of those in the audience are already aware, but essentially the organizations in question, the six Palestinian organizations, who are, have been the target of this uh, particular situation have been essentially designated as such and seem to be engaged in terrorist uh, activities when in effect they are, of course, uh, as has been clearly documented, human rights organizations supporting uh, the human rights of Palestinians at this time. Uh, in terms of the analysis that we engage in, we see that essentially the Israeli government's actions in this regard 
are in contravention of that government's support of the Declaration to Human Rights Defenders, which it has repeatedly supported, and in particular, the freedoms of thought, expression, association, and, and assembly. Uh, we are, uh, in effect, very concerned with respect to the manner in which the legality, legitimate aim and purpose and proportionality of the response of the Israeli government in this regard has been justified. We see no clear grounds as a matter of uh, international law for the claims being made by the Israeli government. But without further ado, I'd really like to, to turn over to the rapporteur, Michael Link, to uh, explain to us what, how you see the situation as it currently stands and the manner in which the Israeli government has in effect um, targeted these organizations as terrorist organizations and the chilling effect this has on human rights defenders in Palestine at this time. Well, listen, thank you for this. It's, a, it's an honor to be asked by the organizers of this SOAS event to be part of this distinguished panel. I know both Susan uh, Power and Sahir Francis very well. I have deep admiration for them both personally and professionally. I can only wish that uh, we were speaking under better circumstances. But then again, all three of us are deeply engaged in reporting on the many human rights violations arising from the 54 year old Israeli occupation. And there hasn't been, and there won't likely to be any time in the future, an occasion when one or all of us are speaking on the issue of Palestine without having more bad news to deliver. So Hare and Susan will be speaking on the work of their respective organizations and the impact that this designation as terrorist organizations and unlawful organizations will almost certainly have on the ability of the six Palestinian organizations to continue their top drawer advocacy on behalf of human rights and humanitarian issues in the occupied Palestinian territory. In my short time today, I'm gonna to speak to three issues. First, the invaluable role played by these organizations. Second, the protection for human rights defenders provided by international law. And thirdly, the shrinking space for human rights organizations in Israel and Palestine. So first, these six organization, Al-Haq, Adamir Prisoner Support and Human Rights Association, the Bassan Center for Research and Development, the Union of Agricultural Work Committees, the Defense for Children International Palestine, and the Union of Palestinian Women's Committees are exemplars of the modern human rights, international human rights movement. In my role as UN Special Rapporteur on the OPT, I have dealt with most of these six organizations. Their advocacy on behalf of the homeless, sorry, on behalf of the, of the voiceless has been indispensable. I have a high regard for their research and reports and I regularly re rely on them. I am always impressed with their professionalism and their effectiveness in their dealings with the different UN bodies that do work on the OPT. They speak the universal language of human rights and they regularly pay a heavy price institutionally and professionally for doing so. I deal with a wide range of actors, political, diplomatic, media, civil society, among others. And I know that among these actors, these organizations are well respected for their work. Several of them have received international awards for their human rights work. They offer vital contributions to the international promotion and protection of human rights through their published reports and international campaigns, and their advocacy shines a direct spotlight on the widespread and serious human rights violations associated with the Israeli occupation. My second point for you today goes to the robust protections offered by international law to human rights and humanitarian organizations from state interference and repression. I have three points to make here. My first point is that international human rights guarantees as part of the fundamental freedoms enjoyable by all of us, the freedoms of association, assembly and expression. These are the cornerstone rights for any society and government which adheres, claims to adhere to the rule of law and a rules-based international order. These rights offer a solid shield for civil society and non-governmental organizations, human rights bodies, trade unions, faith-based groups, political parties, and minority rights activists, among others, to function freely and to, and to advocate critically, subject only to reasonable limitations consistent with the rule of law. 
My second point dealing with international law is that the UN General Assembly adopted the Declaration on Human Rights Defenders in 1999. While not legally binding, the Declaration's unanimous support by the General Assembly indicates its political importance for the modern world. In adopting the legal framework for the fu fundamental freedoms of expression, assembly, and association, the Declaration set out a number of commitments specific to the work of human rights defenders. These include the right to conduct human rights work at the national and international level freely, the right to, to effective protection under, interna under national law for opposition to human rights violations, and the right to solicit and receive resources to conduct human rights work, including the receipt of funding from abroad. And my third point on international law is to emphasize that governments must never misuse counterterrorism and national security legislation to hinder or criminalize the work of human rights organizations or to unjustifiably curtail civil liberties. The United Nations Security Council, the General Assembly, and the Human Rights Council have all been very clear that counterterrorism measures must be applied in a manner consistent with international law and cannot be employed beyond their specific and restricted purposes. In the modern world, it has been a temptation of authoritarian governments and of democratic governments with illiberal tendencies to rely upon counterterrorism laws to discredit and smother criticisms of their troublesome human rights records raised by civil society organizations. And the third point that I want to draw, draw to you, your attention is that in my view, as Special Rapporteur, the government of Israel has been significantly deficient in honoring its obligations under international law, including under the Declaration of Human Rights Defenders. From the many reports issued by the United Nations and by civil society, Israel's treatment of human rights defenders, be they Palestinian, Israeli, or international, who work on the vital issues arising from the occupation has been contrary to the basic guarantees of international human rights law. Nor is the situation improving. As Israel's military occupation becomes further entrenched, and as human rights defenders persist with their intrepid activism to investigate and oppose the regime of human rights violations that is integral to this occupation, all of the indications are is that these defenders will continue to be the prime targets of those in the Israeli government who are intolerant of their criticism, yet alarmed by their effectiveness. I fully align myself with the comments made by Michelle Bachelet, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights with respect to this terrorist designation. She said last October that, and I'm quoting, claiming rights before a UN or other international body is not an act of terrorism. Advocating for the rights of women in occupied Palestinian territory is not terrorism. And providing legal aid to detain Palestinians is not terrorism, unquote. In a statement released in late October, shortly after the Israeli government's designation was issued, I joined a number of UN human rights experts in calling upon the international community to reverse this decision. The international community must also continue to support the, uh, the designated and other Palestinian civil society organizations, including financially, as they continue to document and to promote accountability for human rights violations in the OPT. Let me conclude with this. The 54-year-old occupation of the Palestinian territories, which becomes more pervasive by the day with no end even remotely in sight, has been profoundly corrosive of human rights and democratic values. How could it be otherwise? To perpetuate an alien rule over 5 million people against their fervent wishes inevitably requires the repression of rights, the erosion of the rule of law, the abrogation of international commitments, the hollowing out of well-accepted standards of military behavior, the subjugation of the humanity of the other, the denial of trends that are pl plainly evident, the embrace of illiberal politics, and our present concern, the scorning of those civil society organizations that raise uncomfortable truths about the disfigured state of human rights under occupation. It is vital that the international community loudly and insistently defend the defenders. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, um, 
can I just, there are a couple of questions. Thank you so much, that was brilliant. Um, can I just um, pose a couple of questions coming in the chat and then perhaps we can have a discussion amongst us before you leave. Um, I've got a question of my own if I, if I manage to have time. Um, so the first question is whether you have any update on the ICC regarding war crimes. I'm not sure whether that's something uh, you could respond to. Um, and the second question is what notice has the, has the Israeli uh, government ever taken of the United Nations resolutions? Sure, let me try to briefly uh, answer those. Uh, on the ICC, um, I don't have any uh, any particular updates to make. I mean, we know that in uh, in March, the Office of the Prosecutor um, accepted to go ahead on the second stage uh, of its work with respect to the many complaints that have come in respecting um, both Israel and uh, Hamas and the allegations against them. And I suspect we'll, we'll only receive periodic updates, probably through the annual reports of the Office of the Prosecutor with, with respect to this. And unfortunately, we shouldn't expect any quick decisions. I can only imagine that this is gonna be a long drawn out process, particularly with respect to the investigations of the allegations of war crimes in the various uh, commissions of violence in, um, in Gaza. The one area which is, in my view, relatively low hanging fruit has to do with the designation or the allegation that the Israeli settlements, the 300 settlements housing close to 700,000 Israeli settlers in East Jerusalem and the, and the West Bank are war crimes under the Rome statute. That I think should be more straightforward for the office of the prosecutor to come to a decision on, but I suspect they won't come to a final decision on all the issues, including that one, until they've completed their investigations and they made a determination if the facts go for, uh, are strong enough to go forward to the third and final stage, which is going to a trial. Um, with respect to your second question about the notice that Israel may take of, um, of UN resolutions, um, Israel on the one hand feels free to, to ignore these. We have hundreds of resolutions by the General Assembly and by the uh, Human Rights Council that are passed annually um, that Israel has uh, is in violation of. Uh, it's also in violation of some 30 plus resolutions from the UN Security Council. And if I can just speak to that to a second, um, resolutions pe being passed by the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly are non-binding, um, but if they, they may well reflect international law. But when we come to the Security Council, the Security Council has passed resolutions um, that say that the Fourth Geneva Convention applies in full to the occupied Palestinian territory. The Israeli settlements are uh, flagrant violations under international law. Um, and that there are rain and that annexation, particularly of East Jerusalem and of the Syrian Golan Heights, are, are profoundly illegal under international law. Israel has obeyed none of those. Um, and there is Article 25 of the UN uh, Charter of the United Nations says um, that member states must obey decisions made by the Security Council. And when the UN Security Council pronounces on international law, it's making a decision. And yet there's been no accountability. Um, I suspect Sahir and Susan may agree with me. I think the single most important legal issue with respect to this 54 year old occupation and all of the other issues arising uh, out of the uh, subjugation of Palestinians has to be the, the lack, the impunity and the lack of accountability. Criticism without consequences in the modern world means nothing. We don't, we have no other conflict or occupation in the modern world, where on the one hand, we have such a, um, an array of settled law that the occupier is in violation of, but where there is such a huge daylight between uh, the promise of international law and the actual performance of the international community to impose that law. Um, so that's where we stand with respect to this. I'm, uh, I'm actually speaking on Monday with two of my predecessors, John Dugard and Richard Folk, on a panel organized by Law for Palestine uh, with respect to the role of the United Nations. So if anybody wants to have a more detailed, uh, listen to and ask questions on a more detailed discussion of the United Nations and international law with respect to the occupation, I invite you to join that on Monday. Thank you. Uh, does, Michelle, do you want to come in? Yeah, just on that though, with respect to how you see accountability efforts moving going forward, 
what is your view of the most appropriate or the best forum in which to bring those efforts in light of the fact that there seems to be stasis, as you've already mentioned, with respect to Security Council resolutions, sure. the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly? Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it's fairly sparse when you look at the international scene and try to think, figure out where there are accountability paths that would end this impunity. Well, obviously one is what, you, what we've just mentioned is the ICC, um, yeah. but um, as a, a very good early- Sorry, the nature of that investigation seems very discreet and distinct in what it's targeting. It is, but you know, um, I, can only, I can only assume that part of the reason why Israel has, has gone ahead and designated these six Palestinian organizations, and in particular, al Haq, is because of the ICC investigation. al Haq has been among the leading organizations in raising complaints and providing documentation to The Hague with respect to this. Israel doesn't comment about this very much, but I, can, I, I do expect that there is uh, trepidation in the official corridors of power uh, in Israel and among the military, uh, leaders among the administrative leaders among the political leaders with respect to the consequences of an outcome at, at the International Criminal Court uh, with regards to this. Uh, another outlet obviously is through civil society is with respect to the responsibility of businesses who may have links to the Palestinian sorry to the uh, settlement economy um, and the uh, the role of the UN database in wanting to uh, uh, to be able to display those corporations which have direct links to the settlement economy. If the if the settlements are indeed war crimes, or even if they're just flagrant violations under international law, as the Security Council has said, that should be enough to stop uh, companies from any involvement in uh, in those. A third avenue might be, and I'm uh, is the the International Court of Justice. We already have one advisory opinion from 2004, which was valuable in its own right, but I think now is inadequate to meet the new challenges of 2021 and beyond. I'd like to see a new uh, advisory opinion going to the uh, International Court of Justice to ask the question, is the occupation now illegal under international humanitarian law? I think it is. I, I issued a report four years ago to that effect. And I now see that there is actual uh, concrete steps being taken um, to put the question to the General Assembly. Will it ask the ICJ for an advisory opinion on this? The thing is, the international community says, yes, we agree. There are many violations that are associated with the uh, occupation, but the occupation itself is, is illegal. If I say the occupation itself is illegal and therefore has to come to a complete end. And I think seeking an advisory opinion from the ICJ would be a big step towards that in the grounds of accountability. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there is a question uh, asking about details of the Monday debate, if it's possible to get that. So maybe what we could do is perhaps we can put it in the chat if you have that, uh, Professor Ling. Okay. Um, um, yeah, I, don't, I, I can I can give that later on. Well, once I'm once I'm free, my other obligations um, to be able to do that. But if you looked on the website of Law for Palestine, there will be a um, I, I, a direct link to the program for Monday. I believe it's going to be an all day pr a presentation of four different panels, um, beginning at uh, probably nine or ten a.m. Jerusalem time. Um, uh, but it um, there are a number of excellent speakers there. I, I commend the entire program. Uh, to uh, the people who are listening today. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave with respect to this with, with, uh, with great sorrow. I would have liked to have been here for the entire session, but I'm very thankful to you for extending the invitation to me for this. I wish success for the rest of this. And I know that uh, you'll receive brilliant presentations from both Sahar and, uh, and Susan today. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. very much. Thank you. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. your attendance. Bye-bye. Um, so shall we go on to the next speaker and then we can come back to some of the questions that uh, have remained unanswered. Um, is that okay, Michelle? Yes, absolutely. Did you want to introduce the next speaker? Yeah, I'll just introduce Sahar uh, Francis, who's going to be the next speaker. She has been the general director of Ramallah-based Adamir Prisoner Support and Human Rights Organization Association a Palestinian NGO providing legal uh, and advocacy support to Palestinian political prisoners in Israeli and Palestinian prisons since 2000, 
um, yeah, she has joined, she has been general director since 2006, uh, if I'm not mistaken. She's an attorney by training, and uh, she joined the association in 1998, first as a human rights lawyer, then as head of the legal uh, unit. Uh, she has also served on the Board of Defense for Children International uh, for four years and currently sets in, sits in the board of the Union of Agricultural Work Committees. So without further ado, uh, Sahar, would you uh, care to um, begin your talk? Yes. Good evening and thank you very much for organizing this uh, uh, conference. Uh, sorry, I think this is my phone at home. So uh, actually in order to continue what Professor Michael Lenk was mentioning, uh, it should be highlighted that this attack it's not just by this uh, uh, designation based on the anti-terror law or the military orders. The Israeli attack against the Palestinian civil society is uh, 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 have a history of long years of harassment, intimidation, and different methods of how they are trying to affect our work and uh, uh, like uh, uh, because they're not happy with uh, what we are doing on the ground. So if we want to take historically the attack against organizations in East Jerusalem, for example, after the establishment of the Palestinian Authority, there was a systematic attack and they closed and shut down more than 50 Palestinian uh, organizations in East Jerusalem, including the Orient House, because they didn't want it the PA to have any uh, uh, power or any presence in uh, uh, East Jerusalem. Then they continued with uh, uh, shutting down organ charitable organizations, cultural organization, studential organizations based on the allegations that they are connected to Hamas or Islamic Jihad or other political parties. And of course, the uh, attack against uh, the human rights organizations started like more than a decade ago by the NGO Monitor, UK Lawyers for Israel, UN Watch, Rigavim, Imtertsu, all these Israeli right-wing organizations that they started to distribute false information and uh, uh, claim that we are associated with uh, terrorist uh, groups. All these efforts actually to silence us all these years failed. Uh, and this is why we saw this uh, development in, uh, in uh, taking this Israeli law and using the Israeli law in order to declare that we are terrorists. And it should be also highlighted that they, in order to silence us, in order to shut us down as Palestinian NGOs registered under the Palestinian Authority active in the occupied territories, they didn't need to use the anti-terror law founded inside Israel. And this is also a violation for the international law because basically Israeli law shouldn't be implemented in the occupied territories. But I think it was used in this way in order to send a very clear message for the international uh, 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 supporters for the international funders, for the organizations that they have joint projects with our uh, organizations on the ground, for the states that support these uh, civil society organizations, because the Israeli civil law could be implemented extraterritorially and internally against international organizations that they are registered and based in, uh, in Israel, basically. So uh, uh, what it means on the practical level for us, these uh, two systems that were used, the military system and the civil system against us. Basically, the military order comes in order to complement the uh, uh, Israeli anti-terror law and enabling the uh, uh, authorities, the occupation, of course, authorities to raid the offices to confiscate our property, to arrest our, uh, us 
uh, 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 like including board members and general assembly members, not just the employees, uh, uh, freeze the bank accounts and all these actions, they could uh, totally paralyze our uh, work basically. And uh, uh, so far they didn't implement any of these uh, actions, but let's remember that in uh, uh, May this year, they raided the Office of the Health Work Committees Another, uh, the seventh organization actually with the agriculture were committees, both of them, they were designated actually in, in, in January 2020, a year and a couple of months before physically they raided the offices and shut down the offices and uh, uh, hang the military order, asking them to be closed for six months. Of course, the designation is permanent, but the closure of the office physically is about to be uh, finished in December. We assume that they will extend this decision against both uh, organizations. In the same time, they included the agriculture work committees in the uh, declaration according to the uh, anti-terror law of 2016. Uh, of course, legally, uh, all of the uh, six organizations, and I think it will include as well the health work committees, although the health work committees appealed against the military order designation and it was rejected. So the next step is to uh, uh, petition the Israeli High Court. We didn't submit the appeal yet against the military uh, decision. We are not going to uh, uh, exhaust any legal procedure according to the anti-terror law. And here I would highlight the legal analysis that was published yesterday by Adala, uh, uh, the legal center inside Israel, that they are representing and supporting uh, uh, most of us. Uh, and they uh, explained very well why actually legally it's not uh, going to be considered as a due process if we try and there's no chance actually to win this case neither in front of the high court or in the military procedures because basically all the allegations would be based on secret information and uh, if we request to get these allegations we will not get the secret information, and this is would be affecting seriously our chances to defend ourselves and to argue against these allegations brought in the uh, uh, military uh, decision or in the anti-terror uh, uh, law. And uh, so far, we are continuing with the efforts of the uh, campaign that we started in the local level and also in the international level, mainly. Uh, um, we are trying to put pressure on the European Parliament in the European uh, institutions like the Council, the Commission, and the, uh, of course in the United States as well, because we believe just a political uh, pressure could make the Israelis cancel these decisions and uh, stop attacking uh, the civil society organizations. I will not enter into much details about the work of the ICC because I assume my colleague Susan will represent the case of the International Criminal Court and all the work with the criminal court, but it's uh, very important to highlight that all the six organizations, basically our work is covering most of uh, uh, the uh, serious violations that taking place on the daily level on the occupied territories, starting from the land issues and the uh, agriculture uh, uh, issues, supporting farmers, especially in Area C. And we all know that the current political discourse is very important uh, when it comes for Area C and the annexation plan that Israel is trying to implement. And this is why organizations that they uh, invest and work in Area C would be uh, uh, targeted, uh, whether on the level of the uh, support to women or children or prisoners, the most vulnerable uh, groups in the Palestinian society. And uh, uh, of course, our work as a Domir and Defense the Children uh, uh, that focus on child prisoners' rights, 
versus the UN different uh, uh, procedures and the ICC, because also we submitted uh, uh, different cases to the International Criminal Court when it comes for the transfer of the prisoners to into, uh, into prisons inside Israel and torture, arbitrary detention, and other violations. The fair trial, uh, uh, not offering a fair trial in the military courts, this is, would be considered as well a, a war crime and crime against humanity. So we are aware that these are the uh, uh, cases and the legal work and the advocacy and the efforts that brought the uh, uh, occupation to escalate its attack against uh, uh, us and uh, their efforts to silence us and to affect our uh, daily work. And all these uh, allegations that we are uh, uh, involved in money laundry or in association with any terrorist attack, this is uh, not true. It's, there's no factual base for this uh, um, information. And it should be highlighted as well that the whole legal case that is taking place currently against some of the employees from the health work committees, it's not ended yet. There's no uh, core decision uh, in relation to especially the uh, most important information that the Israelis claimed that they have and they uh, drafted it in the dossier that was presented in May to the European side and the Europeans said it's not enough, it's not sufficient, and we are not going to take decisions based on this dossier. And this dossier was published lately in the Israeli media. And actually it's two confessions or let's say statements of two detainees that they are still uh, imprisoned and awaiting trial. And the military court didn't even started to, uh, to hear the arguments against these uh, two testimonies, and then they decided to use them as a base for uh, this designation. And the military court confirmed last week that the plea bargain that the uh, Spanish citizen, Juana uh, Rishmawi, that made in the military court, it's not a sufficient evidence in order to be used against the six organizations. All these uh, uh, developments, all these uh, uh, facts actually uh, uh, supports our argument that locally on the legal level, there's no chance to win this case if we are going to submit any case, any legal case in front of the Israeli system. I will uh, stop here and uh, of course would be happy to answer any of the questions in the discussion. Apologies, I had to unmute myself. Um, shall we go to Susan and then have questions for both of you and comments? Michelle, is that okay? Okay, so um, our third speaker is um, Dr. Uh, Susan Power, who's a legal researcher for Al Haq uh, organization, which is a Palestinian human rights organization based in Ramallah, uh, quite well known internationally and locally and regionally. Um, and she also lectures on law at uh, Griffith uh, College. So um, welcome, uh, Susan. Thank you for taking part in this and looking forward to your uh, talk. And thanks, Sahar, again. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the organizers and thank you to SOAS for the invitation to speak um, on this important subject of defending the right uh, to defend Palestinian rights. And of course, this topic is particularly relevant in, in light of our recent, uh, the designation um, of al Haq, the organization that I work for, along with the five other civil society organizations um, as terror organizations. And this basically like outlaws our human rights work. Um, both in Israel under the counter-terrorism law of 2016 um, and under military order as well in, in the occupied Palestinian territory. Uh, so just to give some context about the work of al Haq, uh, al Haq was established in 1979 to monitor and document violations um, of human rights and humanitarian law in Palestine, regardless of the perpetrator. So in our work, we document and record violations of law against the Palestinian people, both by the Israeli occupying authorities and the Palestinian authority. 
And as Michael Link um, already alluded to earlier, we have been um, the recipients of, uh, of a number of international um, human rights awards. So we've had um, uh, been conferred with seven, 11 sorry, international awards to date, um, including the 2010 uh, Guzen Penning Prize for Human Rights Defenders, the 2018 Human Rights Prize of the French Republic, um, the 2019 Human Rights and Business Award, which was awarded at the UN in Geneva, um, and in 2020, the Gwyn Skinner Human Rights Award for Corporate Accountability. Um, so altogether, our work and the work of Al-Haq um, includes um, engaging with UN mechanisms, we submit, um, we submit UN special uh, procedures, we engage with the Human Rights Council, we do advocacy to third states, uh, we engage in legal research and also accountability work. Um, and as Sahar has just mentioned there, um, our work has also recently included a number of really key um, communications to the International Criminal Court. So, so far we have submitted um, six joint uh, communications to the prosecution of the International Criminal Court. And we've provided um, evidence of war crimes and crimes against humanity um, committed by individuals in the Israeli army and the Israeli authorities against Palestinian victims in the occupied Palestinian territory. And to date, we've had quite a measure of success before the International Criminal Court. So following the close of the preliminary examination, um, Al Haq submitted an amicus curiae to the pretrial chamber um, on the question of territorial jurisdiction of the court um, over crimes committed in the occupied Palestinian territory, that is the West Bank, including East Jerusalem um, and the Gaza Strip. And then this year, the pretrial chamber found that the court did have territorial jurisdiction. Um, and then the prosecutor then formally opened the investigation. So right now we're at the investigation stage and we're currently engaging with the investigation team. So I suppose what's important to note is that Israel um, systematically denies international access to the occupied Palestinian territory. So it denies access to UN special rapporteurs, it denies access to investigators from the commissions of inquiry and fact-finding commissions, um, and we also expect that they will probably um, deny access to the investigator to the investigation team um, of the International Criminal Court as well. So what this means um, is that these um, teams, uh, the investigation team and the, the fact-finding commissions, um, they rely on al haq and other uh, Palestinian human rights organizations um, to coordinate and provide the international community uh, with the requisite documentation of Israeli, of Israeli crimes. So these crimes include um, the indiscriminate killing of civilians, torture practices, property appropriation, house demolitions, um, forcible population transfers, and mass arrests and detentions, and other acts of persecution and apartheid. Um, so it is because of our human rights work that Israel has targeted our staff and organization with the smear campaign and delegitimization. So this has included death threats against our general director, Shuan Jabarin, um, and our legal researcher, Nada Kiswanson, specifically for our work on the International Criminal Court. Prosecutor Ben Suda, in her 2016 report on preliminary examinations, noted that staff members of certain organizations that have gathered information of relevance um, to the Office of the Prosecutor for the preliminary examination, um, such as Al Haq um, and staff in Al Mazan as well, had been subjected to threats and other apparent acts of intimidation and interference. Um, she said the situation had been taken very seriously, including at the level of the Dutch authorities as the host state to the court. So since then, Israel has tried to cut off the funding of our organizations, and it even established a ministry whose sole purpose is to smear Palestinian human rights organizations working with the court. So it insinuates links to terrorism and then presents these reports to European funders to try and cut off our funding. So the most egregious of these was published by the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs in 2018 and 2019. Um, and these included the money trail report, uh, reports and terrorists and suits. So these reports contain a number of defamatory attacks against the human rights organizations. Um, and they call on the EU and EU member states to hold their direct and indirect financial support and funding, both to Palestinian and international human rights organizations. So the reports characterize what actually is legitimate human rights work um, as the evolution of tactics employed by terrorist organizations to attack the state of Israel. So these so-called terrorist tactics 
have been outlined by Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs, um, who really rather bizarrely links the work of human rights NGOs uh, with these terror tactics. So he says that NGOs, um, that in their eyes, the path to mainstream acceptance requires adopting legitimate methods of action. And as a result, terrorist organizations have embraced a new approach um, at the basis of which is a waging of a campaign of against Israel in the public opinion and legal arenas. Um, while he says they are cynically and deliberately exploiting human rights NGOs perceived in the West as legitimate. And he then continues to explain that to our understanding, terrorist organizations hope in this way that they will co-opt civil society to push their respective governments to place pressure on Israel with the aim of curtailing its defensive and economic freedom of action. So he is basically equating legitimate human rights work respected by Western states as terrorist tactics. The report also specifically targets our work on the International Criminal Court. For example, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs report describes Al Haq as leading the legal effort to delegitimize Israel at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. And in a rather myopic profile of Al Haq, it names only two staff members again um, the General Director, Shawan Jabarin, um, and the head of our uh, Europe office at the time, Nada Kiswanson, um, as the senior officials at Al Haq, uh, both who had previously engaged with the court and both who had been subject to, to death threats. The Strategic Affairs Report Money Trail um, similarly, con uh, similarly concern, has concerns with the funding of NGOs linked to what it calls terror organizations. So this report outlines what it sees as the problematic work of Al Haq, and it notes that Al Haq is a Ramallah based Palestinian organization. It's a member of the Palestinian Human Rights Organizations Council, um, and it says the organization uh, promotes boycotts against the state of Israel and again has taken action against the state of Israel in the International Criminal Court and the United Nations Human Rights Council. So again, these sweeping terror links and claims, these are merely very basic human rights work. And even then, Al Haq is not even part of the boycott movement. We do recommend that corporations conduct due diligence assessments regarding their settlement activities in the occupied Palestinian territory and responsibly disengage from the illegal settlement enterprise. For Al Haq, we understand um, that the campaign of smears is really part of Israel's systematic policy of silencing opposition. Um, so that it can maintain its apartheid system over the Palestinian people as a whole with complete impunity. One of the elements of the crime of apartheid under Article 2F of the Apartheid Convention is the persecution of organizations and persons by depriving them of fundamental rights and freedoms because they oppose apartheid. And for us, these terror designations, these all constitute criminal acts of apartheid. I think also a really relevant development that had taken place a few days before the terror designations um, on 19th of October, um, three days earlier on the 16th of October, Al Haq had actually contacted frontline defenders um, on the suspicion of a spyware infection um, on one of the iPhone devices of our staff members. Um, and frontline defenders conducted a technical investigation and they found that the phone had actually been, been infected since July 2020. So our staff had actually been under surveillance by Pegasus spyware. Um, we then um, opened up the investigation um, and investigated 75 iPhone devices right across the six organizations um, who were later designated as terror organizations. And it found that there was six phones um, had been targeted with this surveillance technology. It also transpired a few days later that the um, that persons working in the, in the Palestinian Ministry of Foreign Affairs who were working on the case file um, um, of the International Criminal Court, that their phones were also infected with Pegasus spyware. So there's considerable costs involved. It's not cheap to infect the phones with Pegasus spyware. This would have amounted to around 500,000 US dollars. So while Pegasus belongs to the notorious Israeli company NSO Group, we really can't say for certain that these attacks are launched by Israel, but we can certainly draw the dots on this and make our inferences. So for us, it is our human rights work 
uh, which has led Israel on the 19th of October to designate our organization along with the five others as terrorist organizations under the counter-terrorism law of 2016. And the, the, the designation itself, um, designation order 373 states directly that the promotion of steps uh, against Israel in the international arena um, uh, uh, constitutes part of the terror organization's struggle against Israel. And in this way, it targets our legitimate advocacy work. On the 3rd of November, then, the Israeli military commander in the West Bank issued a military order giving effect to the designation in the occupied territory. So one month after the designations, just a few days ago on the 23rd of November, Israel backpedaled on the original designations um, and it inserted a clarifying PR amendment, uh, basically saying that the al haq institution has been declared a terror organization because it constitutes an inseparable arm of the Popular Front terror organization and not because of its said civil activities. It kind of it, it just slipped this into the designation order, and we believe that this is a PR stunt um, in relation to our ongoing advocacy. So the net effect of the designations is some quite serious risks um, related to it. Um, our staff can be arrested and put on trial in the military courts um, for membership of an unlawful organization. Um, our funds, salaries and property can be seized. And again, this is all because of our legitimate international human rights work. It's also worth noting, and as Sahar has also, also already pointed out, um, that these designations are premised on a shambolic and discredited 74 page document of evidence, um, some of which was obtained um, from Palestinians who work in a completely unrelated organization and who were subject to very grave interrogation practices, which are prohibited under international law as torture. In May, Israel shared the document with EU member state partners in an attempt to hold the funding of our organizations. And the 74 page document was met with complete skepticism by the EU member states who derided the allegations as not being substantiated. When the member states decided to continue their funding of al haq and the partner organizations, Israel then responded by designating our organizations as terror organizations under the domestic law and the military order. So even one month after the designations, just a few days ago, the EU representative for foreign affairs, Joseph Farrell, said the EU had still not received any convincing evidence. So why is Israel escalating the attacks on our organizations now? So we've been operating in the West Bank since 1979. Well, after 54 years of military occupation, there are now over 700,000 illegally transferred in settlers living in 300 illegal settlements in the West Bank. These are crimes within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, whose investigation is progressing and which will see the prosecution of senior Israeli military commanders and politicians. Following the opening of the investigation, Israel's foreign minister, um, Gabi Eshkenazi, tweeted that the decision by the ICC chief prosecutor to open an investigation is a political decision that turns the court into a tool in the hands of extremists who back terrorist organizations and anti-Semitic bodies. The designations of our organizations is patently clear. Israel is trying to avoid individual criminal accountability at the International Criminal Court. This is why Israel is targeting our organizations to silence our voices and ensure its crimes are continued with impunity. Following the designations, we've really appreciated the strong international support, and we do believe that more can be done. We want to thank SOAS for the statement of support, which was signed by the 75 academics, um, and also for drafting the joint urgent appeal. Um, and these um, actions are really important, um, and we would ask that actions are continued. So we'll be launching a website next Wednesday um, for Stand with the Six, which will have um, various uh, samples of letters that uh, people can send to their parliamentarians. And we would ask that people continue the support um, and that, uh, that civil society continues um, to stand with the six. Um, and things that we would ask in particular 
um, is for the United Kingdom, for example, to use its leverage with Israel to pressure Israel's Minister of Defence to urgently rescind the designations and for the United Kingdom to issue a statement condemning and not rec recognizing the terror designations. For the United Kingdom to publish a bulletin uh, to banks and financial institutions, putting them on notice to dismiss as inapplicable Israel's terror designations. And for the UK to remove terrorism clauses as internal conditions placed on donor funding of civil society organizations in the occupied Palestinian territory. And also for the UK to discontinue the UK-Israel Trade and Partnership Agreement and to introduce legislation to prohibit the sale of settlement goods and services. We'd also ask for the UK to increase financial contributions to the International Criminal Court and to respect the independence of the prosecutor. And for the UK, finally, as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, to take concrete and immediate measures to end Israel's prolonged occupation of the Palestinian territory, to bring the apartheid regime over the Palestinian people um, since 1948 to an end, and to ensure effective remedy and redress for all Palestinians, including the right of self-determination and the right of Palestinian refugees and exiles in the diaspora to return to their homes in Palestine. Thank you. Susan, that was amazing. Thank you so much. And I really, you know, kind of, uh, as someone who works on kind of discourse language narrative, um, the idea and, and, and the fact that the Ministry of Strategic Affairs has been uh, very active, you know, it was set up to try and, and uh, talk about issues and influence international opinion uh, and international policy in different ways. And uh, they use the language of uh, terror in particular contexts. So um, it is quite interesting to hear uh, what you've said. Um, Michelle, do you want to come in? Because we have a, a couple of questions, one to uh, Sahar, and then maybe we can um, have more questions come in as we, as we begin the talk amongst ourselves. Sure. Thank you very much to both the speakers today for enlightening us and for giving us such a detailed and important um, uh, background and also just to, to really lay out for us both the manner and the way in which these allegations of terrorist uh, organisations is just completely unfounded. Um, maybe if I begin with Sahar, um, as a P Palestinian yourself who has been engaged in human rights work uh, for over, for decades now. Uh, what is the personal threat that you feel with regard to this and how does that affect you personally in, in terms of your own human rights work um, on the ground? It could be very serious. If they decide to implement the Israeli law, it means I could be arrested as the director of the Bamir, prosecuted and sentenced for up to 25 years. This is, uh, uh, looks very uh, serious uh, because you know the Israeli uh, anti-terror law of 2016 was developed actually uh, uh, based on uh, the security uh, regulations of uh, 1945 and other Israeli uh, uh, laws that was related to terrorism and illegal organizations. Uh, basically, it's uh, like, as I said before, the paper of Adela's Legal Center is very well uh, explaining the problematic in this law and if it would be implemented and the way how the crimes are described, the actions actually, how it's described in a very vague uh, um, language. So even if our legal work representing Palestinian prisoners in the military courts and defending them in the uh, 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 Israeli prisons could seem to be a very legal work, doesn't mean that they cannot designate us as a, a, a terrorist organization. As Susan uh, said, in the designation order, they claim that it's not because of our legal work because of the uh, relation with the 
political party that they consider to be a terrorist party. So actually, it could be very serious. On the ground, as well as lawyers, uh, we cannot keep represent in the name of Dhamir, of course, because now being associated with these organizations working, or as I said, board member, or uh, any support that you offer for this organization or promote the work of this organization would be con uh, considered as a crime, whether according to the anti-terror law or the military order. So people could be arrested easily and prosecuted. Do you think it also further threatens the people that you're trying to assist through your work? Does their association with you in effect place them in a further, a worse position as well? Sometimes, yes, of course, because I think uh, um, not being fully aware about the consequences of uh, the use of both systems, this is will spread fear within the prisoners community and their families, especially whether we would be able to continue to defend them or not, of course. And you mentioned already that uh, you, have, you have taken the view that there is no recourse to justice within Israel itself. And just to let out, I'm sure our audience already knows, but just to confirm that it's the Minister of Defense himself who would uh, in effect be the one who would determine your appeal in, in respect of one of those proceedings. And uh, he himself can therefore de decide at his own discretion whether or not to, uh, to lift this designation of terrorist organization, is that correct? Yes, but based on a consultation that he will get from a special committee that basically yeah. also the uh, committee is in theory, supposed to be an objective and uh, independent committee. But again, the uh, composition of this uh, committee is problematic. And the fact, at the end of the day, the use of the secret information is the most important uh, issue in the whole process. Because uh, uh, from our experience as legal organizations dealing with cases, whether it's about administrative detention, house demolitions, uh, eviction, forcible transfer of people, destruction uh, uh, of houses, uh, demolishing uh, houses policies, there's always a use of the secret information. And when it's presented for the Israeli High Court, unfortunately, in more than 99% of the cases, I would say that the High Court will confirm the request of the state based on the secret information and dismiss the cases. So actually, this is the very problematic issue in the whole procedure that when you base your decision on secret information, how come we can guarantee a, a proper defense and how we can expect that we will win this case? It's very clear from the beginning that we will lose the case. And this is why it's, a, 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 it's very problematic. And this is why most probably we wouldn't be engaged in any legal procedures internally. Thank you. Uh, can I comment because there is a, a question in the chat by Gumilar, which uh, you know perhaps we can we can inform uh, our um, our attendees about the conditions that Palestinians live under in the occupied territories. Uh, and the question is is a question saying, kind of asking whether it is true that Palestinians have to pass by checkpoints uh, to to uh, to get their medicine or something like that. So perhaps. Perhaps you could, you could, perhaps we could, you know, in a way, it is, um, it is uh, settler colonialism, and we have to think about it that way. But perhaps, Sahar, you could, because the question is posed to you, um, in a sense about everyday life uh, and about uh, conditions, uh, lived conditions of Palestinians. And then I, I have a question for uh, Susan, if no one else is coming in. I think it's a, a really very complicated, uh, difficult uh, situation if we want to describe the system of the checkpoints, the bypass roads, the tunnels, the gates, the wall, 
and all this complication of how Palestinian could live and how the freedom of what it means, the freedom of movement while living in the Palestinian occupied territories. But in order to make it a, a short story, imagine that there's uh, around 500 different checkpoints and uh, uh, closure uh, uh, um, um, imposed on different, like just imagine Qalqilia as a, as a city where the wall is surrounding and there's gates and there's one entrance for the whole place. And when they decide to close the gate, people cannot go out and in unless if they guarantee the permission from the occupation authorities. And tens of villages are closed in such a way where people uh, in need of medical uh, uh, help or education or for your daily purposes, you need to pass uh, at least one uh, uh, checkpoint or one military uh, gate and if you don't uh, uh, allowed you cannot continue and uh, when you leave your house sometimes you don't know when you will be uh, uh, back to your house and lots of cases uh, uh, especially women who were forced to deliver in some uh, certain years on the checkpoints lost their life uh, out of these procedures and so on so it's the whole system of control and oppression against the Palestinian uh, society, of course, on the daily level. Mm. Uh, thank you, Sahar. Um, Susan, you've got, I've got a question from Alan uh, Watts in the, in the chat. Uh, what do you think of the British Labour Party in, in regard to attempts to shut down any discussion of Palestine? Yeah, this is, I mean, this is something that we're seeing. Uh, this is something that we're seeing right across the board, like in, in many different countries. Um, the silencing, um, the silencing of political actors, um, and with with uh, with smears of um, anti-Semitism, um, and it's a huge, it's a huge problem. This um, this abuse of uh, anti-Semitism and weapon weaponization of anti-Semitism um, to close down legitimate um, legitimate discussion um, and political discourse. So this is something that we're seeing. This is something that we're seeing in, in, in many different countries, like right across Europe, um, right across Europe as well. Um, and uh, I think it's something as well that we need to be uh, need to be um, need to be careful of. I know the United Kingdom has um, adopted the IHRA definition um, on anti-Semitism, um, and this is particularly problematic um, because it equates. Um, uh, anti-Semitism and it equates this with the with the um, with criticism um, of uh, with criticism of, of the state of Israel. And certainly, this was in some of the um, certainly this is in some of the explanatory um, clauses um, to the definition. Um, so this is very problematic, and it's so problematic that um, a group of um, of Jewish intellectuals came together a, a few months ago and published um, a new declaration um, called the Jerusalem Declaration, um, where they where they have stated that they that they have objected. These are very senior, high ranking um, intellectuals, senior um, professors in various uh, in various institutions, um, and a, a former UN special rapporteur, Professor Duggard as well. Um, but there's a few, and they. Uh, 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 many people signed on to this, and they have um, they really questioned that IHRA definition as not being um, as, as as not being a sound definition, um, and as one which is particularly problematic when it comes to the the question of Palestine, um, because we have very real we have very real issues here. I mean, I, I'm based in Ramallah now at the moment, um, and like what we're seeing and what France, what Sahar Francis described just now, like with the, um, with the, uh, with the checkpoints and the denial of freedom of movement and the, the fragmentation of the territory, this is all part of a, a, a framework and a fragmentation and a segregation, which is, which are acts of apartheid and acts of apartheid are acts where, um, what, where there is one group maintaining um, domination over another group, and that one group 
is Israeli Jews maintaining domination over another group, Palestinians. And if we can't use the language of the apartheid convention and we can't use the language of the, the Rome statute, you know, if we can't use legal language to describe um, legal violations which are ongoing in the territory without being branded as being anti-Semitic for saying that Israeli Jews are maintaining domination over the Palestinian people, which is the framework of the apartheid convention. We are entering into very, very serious problems where actual crimes against humanity cannot be even called out and cannot be discussed because of an IHRA definition. This is, this is profoundly disturbing. And this cuts, to the, this cuts to the core of freedom of expression. And this cuts to the core of even um, accountability for international crimes. And it, it creates a further violence for Palestinians because first of all, Palestinians are suffering very grave violations amounting to crimes against humanity. And then when they speak up, and call out for the international community to intervene and to stop and to stop maintaining a system where Israel continues its, its, its violations. They're silenced and targeted and suppressed as being anti-Semitic. And then when, when politicians in third countries also speak out, they're targeted as being anti-Semitic. So it's layers and layers and layers of violence and the amount of harm and damage that this is causing. It's really unquantifiable. It's 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 it's, it's very disturbed. Oh, uh, thank you. There are two questions to Sahar. I I think uh, before I come back uh, to you, uh, uh, Susan, and and the first one is around whether um, in terms of are there any international groups allowed to examine or or to uh, or or to work with prisoners like it was allowed in South Africa. And the second one is, given the use of law by the colonial state to legitimize the occupation, um, are the, how important it is for your organization to continue to engage the law both domestically and internationally? So on the first one, uh, actually in the uh, Israeli prisons, the access is allowed just for the International Committee of the Red Cross as an international uh, UN uh, uh, side that is allowed to enter to the uh, prisons and to monitor the conditions. But of course, they are bound by the treaty with the Israelis uh, uh, in a way that they cannot publish their information and the violations that uh, they uh, document. And this is the main problem with the uh, work of the ICRC. It's uh, mostly secret. And they would be banned as well, uh, for example, under interrogation when us as lawyers are banned meeting with the detainees under interrogation. It's not allowed as well for the representatives of the ICRC, which is very uh, 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 like problematic because they are supposed to monitor the torture and to guarantee that there's no use of torture and their interrogation. And still, unfortunately, they accepted this uh, uh, procedure by the Israeli uh, uh, intelligence uh, services, and they're silent uh, on this uh, level. On the second question, uh, using the internal legal system is very problematic, actually. And uh, uh, as I said before, uh, for example, B'Tselem decided at some point as an Israeli organization on all these attacks by settlers and violations that takes place in the occupied territories, they're not anymore engaging in the local investigation process because they concluded that there's no success in exhausting and trying to exhaust the internal legal system. And we can confirm from our uh, legal work on the level of torture and other ill treatment and violations that it's zero success for cases of torture that we try to argue in front of the internal legal system. And this is why for us, it's very important to exhaust and use the international system. And this is why we are involved much and more and more cases are brought from our side to the UN different mechanisms, to the ICC and in other uh, uh, platforms. But I think it should be highlighted as well that in the case of prisoners, for example, Damir for a long time 
thinking about a step of boycotting the military court system. But we cannot implement this without a whole strategic national plan for the liberation and the struggle and ending this occupation. We cannot ask a 16 years old boy that is arrested under this system to boycott the, the court without offering an alternative how he is supposed to defend himself. Thank you. Um, there is a question. Michelle, do you want to come in? Yeah, thank you very much, Sahar. That's really an important uh, intervention for us to understand the situation and the notion of the way in which law has essentially failed or, or, or cannot, cannot be of any, any use to you, uh, at least in Israel. I wanted to turn back to Susan. I mean, you, you very much paint a picture there too of the mounting um, pressure anxiety and extremity of the situation that your your organizations and others in Palestine are feeling and certainly there is this sense that there's a lawfare narrative now underway in which you're being targeted as terrorists in order to essentially you know out, outlaw anything that you're able to do or capable of doing in Palestine uh, what is your view in respect of what the next or the, the best next steps are in terms of international approaches or accountability. Uh, do you agree with Professor Link that um, a, an advisory opinion from the ICJ as to the legality of the occupation itself would be a, a good avenue to pursue? Do you think it's more imminent than that? Should there be stronger uh, push toward ICC investigations? Where do you think the, the response should lie? Uh, well, first of all, we are, I mean, we're in the process now with the International Criminal Court. So like even, even a few days before the designation, like we had been, we had been in communication with the, with the investigation team um, from the court. So this, this, this attack is very deeply weighed and very deeply related to that ongoing investigation. I think we need to do everything in our power to ensure that the organizations um, are maintain their viability, that we're able to, to continue our work and that we're protected and shielded from these attacks. So like it's our most important thing right now, like as an organization is just continuing that flow of information and that channel of information to the court to ensure that we have, to ensure that we can continue sending our communications and to continue our work and that that is not, that that is not impeded in, in, any, in any shape or form. Um, and so in order to protect our organizations, we need, um, a, we need a huge political, a huge political pressure um, on the Israeli Minister of Defense to rescind the designation. Um, and I, I really think that this, I mean, this should be seen for what it is. This is a political attack. This is a political designation. I think we really do ourselves damage um, by looking at this as some sort of, um, by going through a legal process or potentially even engaging in a legal process. This, the, the law itself is so, it, the counterterrorism law of 2016 is so manifestly and profoundly um, disproportionate and unproportionate. It is, um, it, it gives such wide sweeping powers to the minister to defer, to designate any organization um, as, a, as a terror organization um, based on secret evidence. And it can, it, like, it can never, this can never be properly scrutinized or challenged in any in any legitimate court proceeding. So it's it's really important that we see um, that we see the system for what it is. It is an inherently unjust. Um, we would never get any type of justice um, taking a legal action um, to even challenge this. So we really need political action. So we need to see um, we need to see support from third states. You know, and for civil society organizations to pressure third states to really continue um, to, to, to maintain pressure on the Minister of Defense to rescind the designations. And even if they don't rescind the designations, to not recognize the designation. So to continue to, to continue to, to, to communicate and to act with the, with the civil society organizations um, and to see the de terror designation as something, as an act that is not recognized. And it's not recognized and an act that's not recognized because it's, it's, it is essentially an act which amounts to an act of apartheid. It's an act which, which deliberately is intended to silence 
and not just silence, dismantle civil society organizations and dismantle them because they're calling out crimes in the, in, crimes in the occupied territory and crimes amounting to the crime of apartheid. So there should be non-recognition of these acts by third states because these are, these, are, these are acts which are internationally wrongful acts. So it is important to continue that, it is important to continue that pressure and to, to keep this up. Um, and I, I do think there's still room there legally um, for the counter-terror, the counter-terrorism law itself um, to be examined. Um, like this law itself was the subject of, of 10 years, um, uh, 10 years of development and was overseen by four different committees who worked on it. Um, and it was clear in those committee, in those committee stages that there was very sweeping powers, which were even at that time um, warned against. Um, and we, the, the section, like to be, to designate organizations and to be able to designate entities for not actually committing any material acts of terrorism and for um, to have such an abusive law in place, like this law itself needs to be examined um, and, and, and dismantled for what it is. Um, so there's still, I think, some research there to be done um, around this law also. And maybe some maybe some more work with the with the special rapporteur on counterterrorism, um, but this law, like the like the the Patriot Law and Patriot Act in the U.S., I mean, this is a this is a profoundly problematic um, piece of legislation. Um, so yeah, we like we wouldn't uh, we like Sahar Francis. We're um, we're we don't see any hope of engaging legally um, before the. Um, before the courts, because the courts themselves are the long arm of the occupation, they're the the they're the the courts of the colonizer, and they're stacked up to to act um, to to rubber stamp Israel's illegal acts. So we would have huge problems um, in this regard. Thank you, Dina. I don't know if you want to take some of the questions from the chat. Yeah, there's just uh, a couple of questions. One of them um, really really interesting which is uh, a question to the, the panel. Uh, I'm, an, I'm, I'm going to read it out. I'm an Italian Moroccan student. I'm doing research on political prisoners in Jerusalem. The control I experience every day to get through the checkpoint is endless. I'm very stuck with the situation, the control and the constant fear. My question that maybe doesn't have an answer is how can we manage to research writing about the reality we see? How can we pull the history of Palestine out of the institutionalized lie shared by the world? A big question, obviously, but uh, in a sense, uh, it also uh, relates to other questions which were saying, how, how can people abroad do anything to help? I mean, friend, friends, former colleagues of these organizations. And there's a specific question to al Haq whether uh, there are any European, North American or South African university law departments offered to co cooperate with al haq in terms of legal research. And I know that SOAS has done uh, a lot of research on al haq And we have a book by Professor Lynn Welsh Welshman. For those who haven't read it, it's a fantastic history of al haq uh, really uh, gripping and worth reading. Um, so, uh, so, so do, do uh, manage to, to buy it. Uh, but uh, if anyone can answer the question about how do we kind of, how do we, use our research to try and uh, oppose uh, such, um, or how do we use, yeah, to oppose such practices by, uh, by uh, the, you know, Israel as an apartheid state. Anyone wants to respond, you're, you're most welcome. And then I have a question, last, maybe a question. I'll, I'll go first with this one. Um, and I, I, it's great that this uh, it's great that the student is doing the research um, in Jerusalem. I think we have a huge weight of responsibility um, as researchers uh, to communicate um, honestly and with integrity, you know, to the international community um, on, on what we on what we see, and to not um, to not let this kind of, these layers of intimidation to not let that silence us. You know, so we have to, to keep speaking out, to keep speaking out against terrorism, to keep speaking out against um, against the abuse of anti-Semitism, and to keep to keep speaking and engaging with the with the international mechanisms 
and doing everything that we can, um, doing everything that we can in our power um, to ensure as well accountability. Um, I, I completely understand um, living in constant fear. Um, we also live in, live in fear. Um, and fear is, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult, you know, to, to live under these various, um, to live under various, looking over your shoulder, um, not even sure if somebody is, if the military are going to come into the um, institution. And I know Sahar Francis would have experienced this as well. I mean, there was the raids on, on Adamir and certainly since these terror designations, um, the, the fear has certainly um, escalated here and we're, um, we're worried that, um, that there'd be arrests and detentions. Um, and we're also worried that there could possibly be, you know, torture practices because um, there has been um, torture practices um, against uh, people working in other organizations in the Health Workers Committee, for example. Um, and there has been um, show trials um, of Sh um, uh, Shaka Ode, the head of the, the Health Workers Committee um, and others. So we, we we live in, in, in constant fear and looking over our shoulder um, that this may happen. Um, but we also um, we also need to we need to counter um, we need to counter Israel's um, narrative and Israel's constant acts of aggression. And we need to keep speaking out and doing doing everything we can um, using all the mechanisms at the at the at the Human Rights Council at the um, and, and internationally at the International Criminal Court using the um, to, to pushing for another advisory opinion um, and using legal means you know and and peaceful means to counter this um, and I think eventually you know uh, once we see. Um, once we see, see real prosecutions at the International Criminal Court and the, the fruits of our work as well, which, are, which, which is coming to, to, to light, like we have been um, relentlessly working for the last number of years, engaging, um, documenting and monitoring and like we had the release of the UN database a few months ago, we have the opening of the investigation and um, we're pushing now in relation to reconvening a special um, committee on apartheid um, at the um, at the UN level, so we we various we we various goals that we're working towards, and we're using every we're using every single mechanism that we can, and um, through legal and peaceful means. Um, and because this is working, this is why Israel is is, is trying to shut us down. Um, but we need to we need to continue our belief in the rule of law. We need to continue um, our belief in peaceful means and to pass this on as well to the next generation that are coming up behind us. And it's really important that the international community reach out and support our efforts because the reverse of this is so dangerous. We're just a heartbeat away from sinking back into very grave and serious levels of violence. We really need the, the rule of law to be respected and these methods that we're using to be respected. We, we all work and, and, and believe in the UN system and we believe in international peace and justice and we believe in human rights for all. And we need everybody else to, to support us um, in our pursuit of justice and in our pursuit of these beliefs um, and to continue speaking our truth and to protect and preserve our institutions. Uh, thank you. And there was a, a, a big thank you from uh, one of the attendees saying we have to keep this up. Uh, Saha, do you want to come in, please? Uh, I totally agree with what all Susan uh, said. And I would just add uh, one small thing that in order to keep the hope, especially for our own people, like imagine if we fail in this case, how you would convince any more the Palestinian people that Inter international law worth anything at the end of the day in bringing justice to uh, Palestine. So I would just uh, recommend that I think in the level of universities, beside the research, there is a, a space for putting more and more pressure on your governments, on the parliaments in your countries that they should take action. Uh, 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 I think international law without the political will, without the political decisions, it's, it's not going to be implemented. So this is why 
this part of activism in whether on the streets, whether by sending letters, whether by uh, uh, posts, or I don't, there's so many tools nowadays how to push the governments, I mean, to respect their duties and to take actions on this specific case and on the uh, uh, main root cause for all these human rights violations, the occupation itself. Thank you, Sahar. Um, my, uh, my, my question was uh, also, you know, I really look forward, maybe Susan, you can share with us uh, and we can, you can, we can perhaps uh, put it on the website or whichever way we could do that. Uh, the, the website that you're going to launch uh, in relation to uh, either, is it uh, save the six or, or support the six? Uh, because this is really important. Um, and I've been following the uh, hashtags and the campaigns on social media platforms in relation to uh, F Save the Six, because it's, uh, it's quite important to, uh, to follow that. Uh, but I wanted to go back to a, one particular point you mentioned, uh, because I think it's important to emphasize it, which is the timing of the, uh, of the Israeli uh, action. Uh, and the timing in relation to the investigations uh, taking place at the ICC. Um, so this is really important because as we all know, um, Israel has been trying to counter or do everything possible to try and discredit um, any discussion at the a a ICC in relation to its uh, illegal occupation and to the illegality of occupation. Um, so maybe if you could, um, and, and also, you know, the other thing that I was struck by, I, I come from uh, a media background, so we look a lot at discourse and language, and we look at the context within which the language is used, and of course the language of uh, terror and anti-terrorism, it just kind of responds to a wider context of Western, particularly Western countries, kind of using the discourse of terror in different ways for political purposes. Um, so perhaps if you could just briefly, you know, talk about the timing in relation to the ICC uh, and, and, you know, whether, whether there is any connection there or whether people have, have thought about that. And uh, yeah, may, maybe I'm wrong, but I just feel there is something there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like for us, there has been um, like the the work that we're doing on the on the ICC is in itself. I mean, we've been talking about fear and terror, but this 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 work that we're even doing and everybody who's working directly with the court on this, there is um, there is kind of a there is a shroud of secrecy around this. You know, we we can't say too much about it. Um, but there's also there's also layers of fear and layers of um, and layers of uh, layers of terror around this as well because Israel and and the United States as well before it um, have been targeting the have been targeting the court and like only last year we had the U.S. executive order and um, which targeted the court and which designated. Um, which designated the, the the prosecutor of the court and others um, in the court um, um, on a, on a sanctions and placing them on a sanctions list, um, and we were also expecting at this time because um, also um, allies of the United States, such as Israel, were also mentioned um, in this executive order, and anyone who would have materially assisted the court um, would also potentially have been subject to sanctions. So we were expecting a chilling effect. Um, from, from this executive order. So when the executive order was rescinded, when the Biden administration came in, we feel that things changed track um, because we had a huge success, then a huge moment of success um, afterwards with the, the, terror, with the uh, executive order rescinded and the move um, to open the investigation. And we've been waiting um, and knowing that something, that something large will happen over this um, coming from Israel because there was um, such language as well around the, um, around the progress of the investigation. Um, we had Netanyahu, you know, calling the, the, calling the opening of the investigation pure anti-Semitism, and it was, it was being treated as such um, 
was being treated as such as an attack, you know, against the state and as, a, as an attack on Jewish values. So we were expecting we were expecting something, you know, of this nature to come. Um, but also, like I've been working with that hat for a number of years, and I've been working since since 2013. I've been working on the we've been working on um, issues around international criminal law as well. Um, and we had very serious attacks on the organization um, back around 20, 2016. So we had the, with the attacks with the, the death threats against our colleagues, but we had also various um, attempts, uh, we had also various um, targeted attacks in the organization itself and um, with, uh, attack, with issues around um, uh, banks being approached in relation to um, funding that was coming into the organization. And we had all series of, we had all a series of very, um, very strange and targeted attacks, um, uh, attacks on our computers and, and all of this kind of thing. Um, so we're, we're used to expecting um, these kinds of assaults. You know, we can't always point the finger at Israel, but we know Israel is behind them. Um, and so we're used to we're uh, we're used to these kinds of very high level um, uh, uh, targeting and surveillance um, of us. Um, so it was it, it was no surprise when we found out that there was um, surveillance um, and the targeting of the phones of persons working um, uh, on the uh, on the ICC. And then after that, we were we were expecting something bigger. And even to the point where um, when we like on the Monday, we were going to have the, the, the press conference on the, the revelations around Pegasus. Um, and we knew even then when we were going to have this big reveal of the, the Pegasus spyware, we knew something would happen in between that. We didn't know whether there might be raids on the organization, but we knew something would happen. And like the Sunday, just the night before Israel designated the organizations under the military order. And this, is, this again is to deflect attention um, away, from, away, from these, uh, away from these revelations. Um, but the timing, there's always very close parallels with the timing. It's always, there's always, like once we're about to do something, Israel is, has been monitoring, listening into calls and, and reacts in, in some sort of way. And as these kinds of attacks are always very closely aligned. Like we had been in conversations um, with the, we'd been in conversations directly with the court and we were having um, our strategy meeting the week of the, like over in the Hague, the week of the, the terror designations, like the timing of that is not lost on anybody. It's directly related, you know, to the work on the court. And as we go on and as um, individuals um, in the Israeli authorities and individuals in the Israeli military, as they become more targeted with potential prosecutions, we're going to see huge escalations here, you know, in the West Bank and massive, even more aggressive targeting um, of persons in our organizations. And we know this, we know that we're, we're expecting this and we, we know this is going to happen. We've already got a taste of this with the death threats. There's also been other things that we can't, um, there's other stuff that's happened that I can't discuss fully here, but there's been a series of, 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 unpleasant, um, of unpleasant things happen. Um, so we're, we're expecting, we are expecting more of the same. Michelle, you want to come in? And uh, we probably have another five minutes or so before we, uh, you know, kind of close the discussion. Um, Michelle? Only to say that uh, what you detailed and outlined uh, both shows the importance and the significance of ongoing pressure, as you say, from outside for all of us to take on board the importance of continuing to pursue and push for these efforts and to main as, maintain as much as possible uh, both uh, internal pressure on our uh, respective governments in addition to following up and pushing for international efforts, as you've said. Um, the timing doesn't seem lost on me, and particularly after this discussion, as both you and, and Sahar and Professor Link have clearly outlined, even although the particular allegations at the ICC are distinct and based on particular um, alleged war crimes from 2014, it may very well be seen by um, parties in question as being the beginning of much greater accountability efforts, and this is what the fear is, and that's why there has been this retaliation. Um, of course, those allegations, I, I don't have as much um, 
to substantiate them as you do both being NGOs working on this on the ground every day. But it seems clear from what you've said today that that's part of what you're intimating is going on here. So um, I guess my final question to you is, is um, just, is there anything else we can do to assist? Uh, I can imagine that ongoing fear is, is somewhat crippling and uh, our thoughts are with you through, through all of this, just to say you have our, our solidarity and our ongoing commitment to, to from the outside, um, do what we can. If there's additional avenues that you think of, certainly do let SOAS School of Law know and, and others at SOAS who would be um, here as part of that effort. But I don't know if there's anything further you wish to say or, or Dina, whether there's additional comments or questions you had at this no, point. No, thank you, Michelle. You put it really very eloquently and uh, you know very powerfully. Thank you so much. Sahar, do you want to- I comment? just wanted to thank you really for this very, very important discussion. And the only thing that uh, any chance to keep it up all and to keep it in the conversation, that would be very helpful. Yes, we'll try and do that, particularly when we have the website and we'll start uh, tweeting and getting students involved in the activism as well. Um, yes. That is quite important. Yeah, and as, you, as you've, you've clearly articulated, Susan, this is not an issue of uh, taking a, a particular perspective politically. It's about, as you've said, the importance of maintaining the fundamental freedoms that are at the heart of the international system. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The, these attacks on the organizations, these are part of the these are part of the shrinking space. And this is this is effectively eliminating, eliminating the space for us to speak out and for us to, to operate and work in. So it's so important that we have our organizations protected. Um, and there's just the various means to do this. You know, there's a number of measures, there's a number of measures which are happening um, internationally. So there is a, a motion which was just passed in the in the uh, in the Netherlands, um, and we're looking. And there's also a motion which has been prepared in the Catalonian Parliament. You know, so there's various legislative measures which are going through to support our organisations, and this kind of support is really important at a political level because this is. This is a, basically a political assassination of our organizations. This is de designed to completely cripple us so we cannot continue our work. So uh, to keep the voices, to keep the voices raised um, and to keep a spotlight on this, and also to ensure that the ensure that the funding um, continues to flow into our organizations. So that might mean um, intern, that might mean advocacy, even at the even at the point at with financial institutions, you know, to even approaching them, you know, to 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 show that these organizations are legitimate organizations, the acts of the terror designations are um, illegitimate acts, they should not be recognized, and to really push for political actors to fully support and continue to support us. And we really appreciate everything that SOAS has done, the statement, the urgent appeal, um, and if there's any room or leverage to take a look at that counterterrorism law as well, um, that would be really great. Thank you very much. I'm sure that your call will be um, you know, heeded by a lot of uh, scholars or would-be scholars uh, to try and look into that. Uh, but just to say we are uh, recording this, so we'll put it on our website and we'll distribute the, uh, the conversation widely. Uh, and to say thank you to all uh, for joining us. And uh, it's, been, it's been amazing and uh, so powerful and important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, both of you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, Michelle. Bye. Bye.